Today on Straight Talk Africa, the Republic of South Sudan celebrates its fourth anniversary of independence this week. But given the ongoing war and the devastating humanitarian crisis, is there really cause for celebration? That's coming up next right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome straight to Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, July 8th. I am Shaka Sali. My colleague and social media reporter, Maria Majaro, continues on her special assignment in the Senegalese capital, Dakar, her home, sweet home. And today, we'll discuss and analyze what independence means to the people and to the government of South Sudan. And coming up later in our STA inbox, you, our audience, have weighed in on our topic through your emails, tweets, and Facebook comments, and we'll reveal some of them later. But first, July has been something of a historic month for the people of South Sudan. And on Independence Day, July 9th, there is little to celebrate. My colleague, Paul Cisco, has more on the story. As thousands of South Sudanese celebrate their nation's fourth anniversary, hundreds of thousands also mourn their war-torn homeland. It is a time, too, to remember Dr. John Karang, the former rebel commander and first vice president to then-Sudanese President al-Bashir, died in a helicopter crash July 30, 2005. Garang led the rebellion ending Sudan's second civil war and is widely considered the single most influential person in the nation's history. An interim constitution came into effect on July 9, 2005, part of the Comprehensive Peace Accord that paved the way to South Sudan's nationhood on July 9, 2011. Growing pain soon followed and exploded on December 15, 2013, when fighting broke out between forces loyal to President Salva Kiir and rebel leader Riek Machar. Despite multiple peace agreements between the two powerful leaders and regional and international calls to stop the fighting, the killing continues unabated. A leaked African Union document earlier this year said both leaders should go and a transitional government be set up. Peace talks hosted by the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, EGAD, have repeatedly fallen short, and the United Nations Security Council has imposed sanctions on the country. UNICEF says scores of children have been abducted and are being used as child soldiers in the Civil War. United Nations Human Rights Spokesman, Ravina Shamtasini. For more than 17 months now, women, men, and children have been suffering from the effects of this man-made catastrophe. Tens of thousands have died. It is estimated that 2.2 million of South Sudan's 12 million people are displaced. Both sides in the conflict are accused of massive human rights violations, and the civil war has created one of the worst humanitarian crises on the planet. It leaves the world's youngest nation with little to celebrate on its fourth anniversary of independence. Paul Sisko, VOA News. Thanks, Paul, for that report. Uh, now, for the latest developments regarding South Sudan, I am joined by my colleague, John Tanza, Mabusu himself, managing editor and host of South Sudan in Focus, a Voice of America 30-minute weekday English language broadcast, internet, which airs Monday through Friday at 16.30 UTC or 7.30 p.m. East African Standard Time. Good afternoon, John. Good afternoon, Shaka. How are you? I am fine. How does it feel, especially given that uh, we are talking on the eve of the fourth anniversary of the independence of your homeland? It just reminds me about what happened on, uh, you know, January 9, 2011, when the independence was declared. There was a <laughs> air of jubilation. Everybody was celebrating. I was very happy because for the first time, I had something I would call a country. On July 11, 2011? Yes. Yeah, I remember, of course, uh, I had actually been to the country. I had flown to Wau. I had gone to uh, Bor. Uh, and, of course, everybody couldn't wait for that particular magic day. 
So what is it that people really expected and uh, hasn't happened to them so far? Well, the, I, I cover the country on a daily basis, and we speak to people from different walks of life. We speak to people in government control areas. We speak to people in rebel control areas. People are not happy. They want peace. They are saying this is not the country they voted for when they were voting for referendum. They were voting for a country where they will live in peace, where they will get services, where their children will go to school, where they will have hospitals so that when they are sick, they are treated. But they are seeing the opposite. They are seeing a country where people are living in uh, IDP camps as displaced people. They are seeing a country where it is hard to put food on the table. They are seeing a country where civil servants go without salaries for months. And so these are what people are telling us. But what about uh, some words of wisdom from President Salvaki Rumayadit uh, earlier today uh, when the government was in fact being extended uh, to another three years when he said, uh, among other things, and I quote, on the eve of the fourth anniversary of our national independence, I have the distinct honor to salute you in the name of our freedom and dignity. How does that feel to you and to many among your audience? It is indeed a dignifying moment for all the people of South Sudan because as I said earlier, when the flag was raised up, there was a sense of belonging, a sense of identity and a sense of dignity. And that sense is still there. But you know what? If you have no capacity to live as you want to, then you think otherwise. And this is what people are, this, that's why people are talking and saying, we want an end to this war. Because yes, we are dignified, we are proud, but the conditions around us does not encourage us to say we are happy. What about uh, reaction from uh, one of his former key colleagues, and that is, of course, uh, Dr. Riyak Machar, who has asked the president, in fact, to resign immediately, saying his term and is today. This is not the first time Dr. Riyak Machar is saying that. But at this point, when people are looking for peace, that statement might not even settle well with the majority of people who are looking for peace, who are yearning for peace. Because at this point, the whole country is saying they want peace. They want an end to the violence. What about uh, the fact that uh, Riyak Machar goes on to say that uh, the extension uh, of the government uh, Late, I mean, today, in fact, around midnight, uh, would in fact, in many ways, be unconstitutional. A lot of uh, analysts in the region have been saying that. They are saying the only way there will be peace in South Sudan is when the two sides sign a peace deal and agree to work together. Extending the mandate of the government will not bring peace because the rebels are not happy with that because they call it illegitimacy. They are saying the mandate of the government is in the hands of the people. The government cannot extend itself. That is the argument of the rebels. But the government is arguing that they do not want to leave a power vacuum. They want the government to continue so that they can provide security, they can provide services, and until the time for peace comes. So there is two arguments to this situation. Any particular reason why so far those two uh, key groups uh, have not been able to cut a deal. To make it a little bit uh, home, it's power. Both sides are hungry for power. You have seen the arguments from both sides. Uh, President Kiir says he is a legitimate elected leader of the country. He cannot just live like that and hand it over to a rebel. Riek Machar is saying President Kiir is illegitimate he should step down. So the bottom line here is power. But what about uh, the mediation role by the regional grouping, IGAD, for example, and the African Union, for that matter, and the international community? To start with the international community, there is, there is a little bit of, uh, not little, a little bit, there's, there's a lot of frustration from the international community. They have poured in a lot of money to help the humanitarian situation to avert crisis in the country. They are still doing that, but people are saying this has to come to an end. 
And the eager countries are also saying they need to be peace in the country. In fact, there is a proposal that has been given to the two uh, warring parties to study so that they can come back to the negotiating table. But today at uh, the South Sudan parliament when President Kiir was addressing lawmakers, he said two important things. One, he said the proposal is talk talking about uh, demilitarizing Juba. That means Juba town should be under the African Union, IGAD, and UN forces. And he said that is like handing yourself over to someone else to control you. He said that's a red line. It will not happen. He also said um, there is a proposal about governance that 53% uh, of governance in the areas affected by the conflict, that is Jongle, Upper Nile, and uh, Unity, will go to the rebels. And he told the parliamentarians that if you give Jongle, Upper Nile, and Unity to the rebels, you are actually encouraging a breakaway of the country. They will uh, ask for self autonomy So he said that, uh, that is also another red line. So an indication of those statements is, is, is sending a clear message that the government is not even happy with this proposal that was uh, passed to them of late. And it's, we are yet to see when they will go back to Addis Ababa because up to now, there is no set date for the resumption of the negotiations. I see. Well, thank you very much, uh, John, for your insight. It's my pleasure to be here. Now, joining us here in our Washington studios are three distinguished guests. Ambassador Barker Wall, Deputy Head of Mission of the Embassy of the Republic of South Sudan to the United States. Ruth Mwoktang, SPROM slash SPROA in opposition representative to the United States and a former member of parliament in the South Sudan National Legislative Assembly. And last but not least, Noah Gothchok, Senior Policy Advisor for Humanitarian Response at Oxfam America, based here in the nation's capital, where he focuses on Sudan, South Sudan, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Syria, as well as broader conflict and human rights issues. Well, gentlemen, I have to say honestly that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the three of you on Straight Talk Africa for the first time. Thank, Thank you very much. much. You're most welcome. Thank you. Later in the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111, and the U.S. country code is 1. Now, in fact, we do have uh, a few minutes to interact before the break. Uh, let me come to you, uh, I'm a Mr. Ambassador. How does it feel on the eve, of course, on the fourth anniversary of your independence? Uh, is there anything, frankly, to celebrate, given that a lot of people on the ground, frankly, uh, probably you're talking about people with empty stomachs here? Thank you, Shaka. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the Voice of America for uh, hosting this, uh, uh, this discussion. I also want to take this opportunity just uh, as a way of answering your question to congratulate the people of South Sudan for the fourth uh, independence and to say that there is something to celebrate. In fact, this independence uh, came after five decades of a struggle uh, and after having lost over two million South Sudanese people, uh, the sacrifice of our people is what resulted in the independence we are celebrating tomorrow. It is not something that uh, we started four years ago. It is something we started since 1955. The people of South Sudan all over the world have something to celebrate because it is about celebrating the sacrifices of our people, celebrating uh, an achievement that our people have been fighting for for over five decades. I see. Well. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter and we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka and join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA South Sudan. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you, so please, don't go away.
the conflict in South Sudan started in December 2013 when President Salva Kiir accused former Vice President Riek Machar and his colleagues of plotting to overthrow his government. Machar denied the allegations and accused Kiir of carrying out violent purges. The accusations sparked violence among supporters of the groups, causing the death of thousands and leaving millions displaced. Several NGOs have accused both warring sides of committing crimes against humanity, including mutilation, rape, and extrajudicial executions. President Kier has warned that the country is at risk of famine if the violence continues. UN Security Council issued sanctions based on a report alleging the South Sudan People's Liberation Army, SPLA, the SPLA in opposition, and its affiliated armed groups may have committed widespread human rights abuses. I wanted to present music and a side of American culture that is most important to me, that is a part of who I am. They're going to get some incredible performances. That's one of the things I love, bringing these artists in so you can get to see them do what they do. It's soul music, and that's what music is. It's that which comes from the soul. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111, U.S. Country Code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question, keep your comment brief, and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidiu Iwat, and of course this is Straight Talk Africa. Coming to you live from Washington, let me come to you immediately. Uh, Ruth, of course, uh, a former member of parliament and uh, perhaps the youngest member of parliament the last time I checked in Juba, is that correct? Yes. How does it feel for you? It was very good. Uh, actually, they call me the last born of the parliament. The last one? <laughs> and, uh, and, and it's good. It's the, good. The youngest in the National Assembly. So talk to us a bit about your feelings about celebrating the fourth anniversary of independence away from home. You are now in Washington. Uh, well, uh, I think there is nothing bad about uh, celebrating the independence. And uh, of course, South Sudan uh, had not had peace after the independence. Mm. However, the, the, the desire for the people of South Sudan for total independence from Sudan uh, was and will always uh, remain unchangeable. Uh, of course, uh, the, the only thing that they should regret is electing Salvaqir as their president, mm -hmm. who, who later on turned to kill them. There is nothing bad about celebrating it. Even I though see. I'm not in the country, I'm in I the see. mood of celebration. You're not in the country, and of course, uh, you're not a diplomat, so you don't have that, uh, at least, uh, privilege of being a diplomat like your colleague here uh, back. What about uh, the man? Uh, uh, Kerubino, Kwan Yuen, Bor, the man who shot the first bullet in Bor, jungle, you know, in the jungle, in fact. What would he think or how would he feel if we came back today? Kerubino, Kwan Yuen, Bor. I, I believe if, if Kerubino and those of William Yon, uh, those of Guy Tut, uh, those of Garang, if they come back today and they find how South Sudan is, they will not be very happy. Because this is what they have not fought for. What did they fight for, to the they best of your knowledge? They fight for the freedom of the people of South Sudan. And you have freedom from Khartoum, but not freedom from yourself? We have a freedom from Khartoum, but we are not yet free. I see. What about you, Nuwa? Uh, talk to us about uh, your perspective. Uh, you're not, of course, uh, uh, from what I know, you are not a citizen of the Republic of South Sudan, but you are very familiar with what is happening there. From it's what you have been able to see, do you think the ordinary South Sudanese um, human being has a reason for celebrating tomorrow as the fourth anniversary of independence? Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. 
Um, as welcome. you say, I'm, I'm, I'm not a South Sudanese, but uh, having worked with South Sudanese and lived in South Sudan and spent time working on South Sudan uh, for almost 15 years now, I, I always feel like South Sudan is like a second home. Um, so from that perspective, it is terribly sad to see what's happening, um, just deeply tragic to see what's going on. At the same time, um, you know, I, I think through all the adversities that, that South Sudan has suffered, not just in the last year and a half, but over the decades, as, as the ambassador has pointed out, um, South Sudanese people have been strong, they've been resilient, and it's that strength and that resilience and that ultimately that sense of hope for the future that, that, that I celebrate and I think we celebrate uh, tomorrow for the anniversary. But what about if someone were to ask you, what are they really fighting for? Because normally you hear that people are fighting because of the scarcity of resources. This is not the situation in as far as South Sudan is concerned. You have a huge and enormous country that, frankly, is not under cultivation. South Sudan could be the breadbasket of the Middle East. You have oil, you have gold, you name it, and you have very few people to put. What are they fighting for? Why can't they sit in a room and figure out how to equitably distribute these God-given resources? I think that's an incredibly important question, and, and that's exactly the question that South Sudanese people ask me, and I hear themselves asking whenever I travel to South Sudan, whether I'm in Juba, in the capital, whether I'm in any government-controlled areas or opposition-controlled areas, even visiting people in you know, refugee camps in Uganda, uh, outside of the country, people are asking that same question. What is this about? Why is this happening? And how are we going to get back to peace? And I think that's the question that we really need to answer, because this is a man-made crisis. And that's, in some ways, that's very frustrating. But also, that's, that's, that's something that's positive. Because it's man-made, it can be solved by men and by women uh, to bring peace to the country. Interesting. Well. Ambassador Bakwar, uh, anybody, frankly, that is familiar with your country, uh, is familiar with uh, the politics of that region, uh, will join you um, in agreeing that uh, you have a right to celebrate independence from Khartoum. Because, frankly, Khartoum did not do anything to develop that part of the Sudan. But having done that, what do you tell anybody, frankly, who will ask you, uh, very simply, what are you fighting for? Thank you, Shaka. I think this is a very good question. Uh, but before I answer that, I want to also uh, recap on the question you have asked my colleague about what, how, how will our lead leaders, some of the people like Karbina Kwanyan, how would they right. feel if they come back? I think the those, man who yeah, shot the first yeah, bullet. including our lead leader, Dr. John Garan, right. they will feel very proud of our current leader who stood the cause. I think it is very important to understand that even after we signed the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, there was no light uh, at the end of the tunnel. And if it were not for the policies and the determination of uh, President Salfa Kiir, we would not have reached where we reached, which mm. is the independence. Mm. Now, coming to the point of what are people fighting for, I think this question is a genuine and it is a legitimate question to be asked. But I think it should be directed to our former Vice President, Riyad Machar. Why? Because, yeah, because he started this fighting. And, uh, to be honest with you, there was no reason for this fight to occur. How did if it he, is, if how it did is, he yeah, let, let me just conclude. If it is about reforms, as he is alleging, that he started all this conflict because he wanted to bring reforms, he was the first vice president in the previous eight years, almost eight years. So I, I don't think what kind of, reform, of, of reforms he would be bringing. Did he secondly, have, did he secondly, have, did he have secondly, if I may, did second, he have executive powers? He was yeah, he vice did. president, he yes. Did. He did. did he? In fact, the executive powers were removed from him later on by President Salva when he abused those powers. He started accusing the president mm -hmm. and saying the president should step down, following his, uh, his statement to the BBC. Yeah? That is what led to the executive powers to be removed from him. He had executive powers for so, several years. But the point I'm trying to make, there was no need for us to be in this conflict. He could have waited. When he started this conflict in 2013, mm -hmm. President Salfa had two, two years before he finished his term. He could have continued to, to oppose the government politically as his legitimate right after he, he was uh, dismissed from the government mm -hmm. and wait for the elections of 2015. There was no reason 
to drag people back to work. I see. So what about that, uh, Ruth? Uh, I know that, of course, uh, it takes not one, but two to tango. Uh, but does the ambassador have a point here? That, in fact, if anything, the fundamental root causes of where we are have to be traced in the neighborhood of former vice president, Dr. Riyak Machara, as opposed, perhaps, to some who say, in fact, that on the contrary, it is President Sarawaki Umayadat because he's the one who announced that there was an attempted coup on December 15, 2013, and so far, there has not been any empirical evidence to support that claim. Uh, I don't think the ambassador is right, and actually, you know, there is something that the world uh, did not understand, and even the media failed to, to highlight, that the, the conflict in South Sudan has its own genesis in self uh, insisting on, on ob and obstructing the, the democratic reform within the SPLM party, and dragging his feet on convening the SPLM political bureau in order to, to review the SPLM basic document. Mm -hmm. And SPLM national convention was also due uh, in May uh, 2013. Uh, for Ghana Moon, the SPLM former Secretary General, who have now joined the government right. and become part of the government, wrote as many as eight letters requesting the president in his capacity as the chairman of the party to call the SPLM national convention for, to adopt the, the, the new basic document and also to elect new people to a structure of the SPLM. Uh, as per the, the new, the would-be new SPLM new constitution. So for me, uh, and instead of him uh, self acting as a responsible leader, self opted to escalate tension by fudging the, 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 the opposition from the party and, and went on uh, naming people like Dr. Yek Mashar and, and Tabandeng and Alfred Ladogore and the rest of the G11. While he was actually training his own militia from his own tribe mm. that he unleashed on his section of his people in the country, the Nuer people. You had so a the role, of course, from IB8. You have uh, Rebecca. Yes, Yandeng all of them, Garan. the 11 of them, we call them G11. But now they are G10, I suppose. Yeah, they uh, are G10. Exactly and they are many G uh, something. I saw him with yeah. Dr. Machar in Nairobi. Yeah, so uh, uh, with that, I think that is not true. Dr. Riyaka have not started the war himself. And, and it was not because of the presidency. It was the SPLM process that self obstruct not to, not, not to take place. And by doing this, he went ahead by staging coup against himself and, and also uh, committed, committing uh, ethnic cleansing within Juba. That led to, to the eruption of the conflict in 20. But surely, you know, there are some people who have tried to portray the conflict in your country as uh, an ethnic, really, uh, you know, sort of conflict. Is it really ethnic or is it, in fact, political? In the first place, it was political because it was a debate within the Espalam party. But it, see, it happened that self care of his own intention, because while people were, were in the process of institutional reform within the Espalam, mm. he was busy training his own soldier. That nobody knew until the, the war broke out, and they went searching people door to door, killing people. It was actually a surprise to many people. I see. Yeah, it, it started at the political, but it turned to be ethnic. And self himself is the one who make it ethnic because he want to mobilize Denka to stand against Nuer by killing Nuer people. I think we need to really look forward, uh, uh, Nuer. From what you have seen uh, in the course of uh, your work, uh, what do people tell you on the ground that uh, they would like to see? immediately or they would like in fact to see yesterday not tomorrow well i think uh, as you say we have uh, in the country of about 12 million people almost 8 million people who are hungry right now um, 8 million people out right. of 12 million people come on man two-thirds of the country and those numbers are only expected to rise uh, you know those are people who are in need of food who are in need of assistance and what we're seeing because of fighting 
that's happening is that while humanitarian aid groups like Oxfam, like others, have been able to reach a lot of people and save many lives, as the conflict is continuing, many of us are being forced to suspend operations, to withdraw staff. We're not actually able to, to reach people in need. So what people really say to us wherever we go is, we want the conflict to end. They're much less concerned, I think, with how it started, but how it's going to end. They need the conflict to end, and they want to go back to, that, to, to, to their normal lives and, and to, the, to the hope and the dream that, that was South Sudan, which was a, peace, a future of peace, of stability and prosperity uh, for all the people. And, and I, I do want to comment on this. Uh, political versus ethnic issue because I think it's, it's incredibly important that, that viewers uh, in South Sudan and, and across Africa uh, and the world understand that this is not a question of uh, one ethnicity fighting another ethnicity. Um, we've seen in our work so many different stories of people um, from New Air community, from Dinka community, reaching out to, to their neighbors from other ethnic groups, saving the lives of many of them in many cases. Um, and of course there is a, a dimension unfortunately of this conflict that has become ethnicized uh, as it's gone on. But I think between the Dinka people and in the Nuer people, there's not, there's not a hatred between them. And in fact, quite the opposite. There's a great deal of love and respect and, and, and so many positive examples of, of people really helping one another. So from the little that you have seen, would it be accurate or would it in fact be fair to say that perhaps uh, people are actually fighting for government positions? I, I, again, I don't, I don't know why people are fighting, and I think that's one of the hardest things to, to understand when you see, um, you know, people should be fighting uh, to improve the literacy rate. They should be fighting to, to build schools and build roads. Um, and so to see the country sliding into this kind of conflict, it's, it's, it's so sad. And I think that's what uh, South Sudanese from all backgrounds, from all parts of the country, from all political uh, beliefs tell me, which is we need to stop this as quickly as possible and get back on the road to recovery and, and growth and development. I hear you. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment, but first, we'll reveal some of the feedback we have received from you, our audience, through social media. Now, here is our letter of the week from a Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan in the Netherlands who responded to our question of the week. Letter of the week. Gordon Majue Kayen of Kampen, Netherlands writes, I'm a South Sudanese and I'm proud to have seceded from Khartoum four years ago. No regrets at all. There are wars always in Africa when a country is at its takeoff stage because people have limited resources to meet their needs, especially after living in despair for 22 years as a result of civil war in southern Sudan in particular. However, South Sudanese now realize war is not the ultimate solution to our problems and the need for unity to rebuild our nation. On this note, I want to assure you that South Sudan will be peaceful soon, like any other nation within the continent. Like Voice of America on Facebook. Follow VOA on Twitter. Join VOA on our YouTube channel. Like, follow, join VOA. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gidiu Iwat, and welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. South Sudan should be a country full of hope for years after gaining independence from the Khartoum government. Instead, it's now in the grip of a massive humanitarian crisis. Almost 8 million people are in need of aid, and 4.6 million people are on edge of starvation due to an 18-month political conflict between President Sarva Kiir and his former deputy, Riyak Machar. This leads us to our question of the week, which asks, had South Sudanese known that peace would remain elusive in their new nation would they have voted for independence from Sudan, and why? 
Well, thanks for using all our social media platforms to communicate to us. Let us begin with a comment from Straight Talk Africa Facebook fan Aiga Twalib Mansur from Khartoum, Sudan, who writes, As a southern Sudanese, I was among those who opposed the separation right from the start. South Sudanese were better off when they were part of the integral Sudan that being independent may be the late Dr. John Garang would have prevented this unfortunate separation from happening because he was a man of foresight and charisma. He commanded respect from all corners, including the enemies of the South. We gave up what belonged to us because we were misadvised. We thought we had friends advising us, but what we actually have are enemies. Another reminder that we are tweeting live today, use the hashtag at VOA South Sudan, and if you haven't yet, please follow us at VOA Shaka. And speaking of it, let's go to a tweet from the South Sudanese satirical website, Sakam World Press, who tweets, yes, not many at South Sudanese regret ever voting for separations with at Sudan. There would never have been peace, period. We have another tweet from Simon Christopher of Tanzania, who tweets, the question of whether they should have voted for independence is now of less value. What matters is how to rescue the situation. Your reaction, Mr. Basada. Thank you very much, Chaka. I think I just want to go, to go back to the points you raised earlier. You raised a very important point, which our friends in the media have always been raising the issue of whether there is evidence for a coup or no coup. For me, honestly, this is a material. Because for me, if somebody uh, started a conflict, and, and as a fear for his life, as he has been alleging, he decided to move to the countryside. Our former vice president could have moved to the countryside or moved to the neighboring country and not continue with the rebellion. It is this rebellion which has now devastated the country, and people are now talking about famine, and about human rights violations and all other uh, negative things that we could have avoided if our former vice president have elected to follow the democratic means of ascending into power. Unfortunately, that, no. right now, frankly, we, He's are, leading in a a rebellion we now. are in a different league. He's le yeah. We need to be looking for solutions to end what started because you can't change what happened on December 15, the solution 2011. Is, the, solution, the solution is simple. The solution is that he has to stop his rebelling and come back to the negotiating table and agree a peace with the government. And the government is, is, is waiting on, at the peace talk. Any time he is willing to come, we are ready to sit with him and sign a comprehensive peace agreement. But the only thing that is, uh, is of, of, of a concern to us as a government, it is the condition that he is putting on the table. He has to be reasonable because the conditions he is putting at the, uh, on the table at the moment uh, are unreasonable. You but, but let's face it, uh, you, you heard, of course, uh, what your fellow panelist uh, Noah here said, and you also had it... Uh, no, he said a lot of wrong you, things. You also he had... about ethnic cleansing, you, and, and you, if you we go to Juvenal, he will not even show me you, you where those 2,000 or 20,000 are He actually buried. says the issue is political. It, and you also heard uh, what, we, uh, you know, our feedback. It is yeah. you, your, your population is 12 million human beings. According, you, according to the census of 2008, right. it's actually 8 million. It's not even 8 that. million. Yeah. So where do we get the numbers that about 8 million human beings in that country that is why, are uh, on the verge of starvation? Yes, exactly. I'm sure it is our friends in Oxfam and in other uh, NGOs and institutions who, who may be qualified to answer that. But because, whatever, but because whatever, whatever the numbers, the statistic they yeah, have been whatever, flouting whatever the are, are not accurate. And, but, and they are not confirmed by the government. But whatever the numbers, there is empirical evidence on the ground. Yes, of that course. That people are doing the suffering. Of course, in a country people where there is conflict. People cannot have unaccess, unfettered access, for example, to the basics of human life. So, now, the question again is, frankly, are you guys fighting to improve the quality of life of your people? It is or are you fighting to share government or political positions? In fact, the government is fighting to maintain the basic principles of democracy, the basic principles of uh, rule of law, the principle that power should be changed through democratic means. This is what the government is fighting for. The government is fighting to protect the territorial integrity of the country. It is not about power. 
The government is fighting for protection. self -Fakir have proposed elections this year. But the international community was the one who made a lot of noise, and the rebels made a lot of noise, and that is why we have uh, elected to postpone the elections. Well, so it is not about power. I'll, I'll come to that later, because uh, if, in fact, we are fighting to protect the territorial integrity or the sovereignty of their country, yeah. some might say, someone might say, what is the Ugandan people's defense force from another sovereign state doing in Juba? They are most welcome, and, and actually we appreciate their support. Uh, they have been there as a, a result of an agreement. We, we have a defense pact with the, with the country of Uganda. And, and that is something normal. We, we, All we, countries over the world do that. I'm afraid time is not our best ally. We'll come to that later. Let's move on to a posting from Yahya Ahmed Gumer from Jigawa, Nigeria, who writes, Possibly they may not have thought that separation will not be the solution to their social, political, and economic pragmas. But now, only four years after independence, the country has become a theater of war between two antagonistic political heavyweights, whose political ambitions and desires have reduced South Sudan to a war-torn country. And another Facebook comment comes from Othin Jeremiah of the Ugandan capital Kampala, who writes, still, they would have voted yes overwhelmingly simply because of poor governance from the north, not to mention the unequitable distribution of resources towards the south and the laws from the north that made southerners feel like second-class citizens. What about that, Arith? Your reaction? I, I totally agree with, uh, with the people who are saying that uh, the people of South Sudan are really proud to be having their own independence from Sudan. As I say earlier on, this is what we all uh, believe, that uh, coming out from Sudan and become first-class citizen in our own country is a good step, and nobody should regret that. And if I want to repeat my point, the only thing, because we know we have never had peace uh, during the time self Akir become the president, and uh, there are a lot of killing, and even now we are talking Shakasala, uh, th this government is killing people. And uh, they, they are killing a lot of people. They kill people in Juba. And we, we were telling the world that the government have massacred a lot of people. They committed genocide in Juba. And, and now I'm very happy that there is a report from independent source, the UN, from Bentiu, that the government is actually uh, committing a, very, uh, uh, a lot of atrocities, killing people, burning people alive, raping uh, children, girls as young as eight years old, they are being raped, gang raped by, by the government soldier, and castrating young boy and leaving them bleeding to death. And uh, these are the things that the people of South Sudan are calculating, not only, not, not because uh, they, they should regret why they come out from Sudan, everybody's happy. Now what we are looking for is to, to, to call for self care because it's good now his term has ended. Because as I'm talking to you now, self care is not legitimate anymore. It's not legitimate. Not legitimate it's in whose eyes? Uh, in the eyes of the opposition? In, in the, the eye of, of the everybody. Because you, you know, in the eyes of ordinary South Sudanese? In the eyes of who? According to our constitution, mm -hmm. uh, self care term ended on the 21st May mm -hmm. 2015. Mm -hmm. And the parliament term ended on the 8th of March. You know, when the parliament term ended, Therefore, we have now a, a, a constitution crisis. There is, no, there is no government. Of course, the extension, if you could tell me that the, his term was extended, but it was extended by, by a legitimate parliament. That is, a term has ended. And you are a member of parliament? I was a member of parliament, yes. Now, when you talk like that sometimes, uh, Reith, someone might think that uh, you probably don't come from the continent. You're talking about a constitution as if it is carved out of stone. You know as well as I do that um, across the continent of our mother Africa, there are a lot of countries, a lot of leaders who look at that piece of paper called the constitution as a personal manifesto, not a constitution because they sort of assume that role. They in fact remind you of the history of France, let us somewhere, I am the state, and the state is me. 
how can you talk about a constitution in a culture where, frankly, there's no culture for democracy? Is there a culture for democracy in the Sudan or South Sudan for that matter? Well, of course, if I agree with you on some of the point, you know, I cannot, uh, we cannot leave the truth without saying it because things are not going right. I believe I'm saying the truth, and I this see. is what it's supposed to be. I know even self today, uh, when he was addressing parliament, he compared himself, himself with Jesus. And, and, and this is because he believed that he's, he's everything. He's, he's more than God himself. Really? So I, 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 I agree with you that uh, Africa, things are happening the way you know and I know, but we must say the truth. This is what we're supposed to say. I see. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll come that. Well, that does it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate to us. Please keep them coming. And if you are a new fan, drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com or post your comment on our Facebook page. Enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel, subscribe to VOA TV to Africa, and follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, President Obama soon makes his last trip to Africa as president. He will attend the Global Entrepreneurial Summit in his ancestral homeland, Kenya. He will also travel to the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa, and become the first American president to visit Ethiopia and address the African Union. Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, will join him, and she will be with us next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gizio Iwat, and a reminder that you are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. If you wish to participate in our discussion, please call us at 202-619-3111. The US country code is one. We'll continue our discussion in a moment, so please don't go away. Nearly $2 billion are needed to assist conflict victims and refugees. An estimated 3.8 million people are already facing severe food shortages and the number is expected to increase to 4.6 million by the end of July, affecting 40% of the population. Between 1.5 million to 2.5 million people have been displaced. More than 519,000 refugees have fled to Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan, and Uganda. Approximately 117,000 of the internally displaced are sheltering in UN bases, the highest number of people seeking protection since the start of the conflict. Nearly 102,000 or 87 percent of the refugees are women and children. The International Crisis Group estimates that at least 50,000 people have been killed during the conflict. able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. We hope that our viewers are getting inspired when they watch our show. They're getting a view of the world from a different perspective, things that perhaps are not in their immediate vicinity. Today, I could put in on the show something that is a little different, a little unique, and this gives me that uh, you know, inspiration to come to work. If you like today's show, please write and tell us what you think or give us some suggestions. Be sure to tell us what station you're tuned into. Our address, Straight Talk Africa, Voice of America, 330 Independence Avenue Southwest, Washington, D.C., 20237, USA. Or send us an email at africatv at voanews.com. Log on to our website at voaafrica.com or post your comments on Facebook. Keywords, Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Esther Gizio Iwat. And of course, uh, we have to go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. 
Good evening, Samuel from Uganda. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Shaka Sari. How are you? I am hugely terrific. How are you today? I'm very, very fine. Uh, let me go straight to Ambassador Back Wall. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ambassador, sir, how far has the African Union tried to bring together the warring factions in southern Sudan? How is the international community facilitating the negotiations between Reki Mashal and Salva Kiu, the incumbent leader of southern Sudan? Because the audience would tell you that, wait a minute, whenever there is uh, an agreement signed by the two, the two uh, warring factions, then there comes the uh, 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 war. What is your take, Mr. Ambassador? Thank you very much, Shaka. You're most welcome. You want to go for it? Yes, please. Yeah, go thank for you, it. Samuel. This is a very good question. I think uh, the African Union have been uh, trying their best uh, through the mechanism of the uh, IGAD. And the IGAD uh, have managed to bring the two sides, the government and the rebels, together several times. And we have, in fact, signed a uh, cessation of hostility agreements, uh, only to be violated time and again by the rebels. <laughs> the, last, the last one, don't laugh, the last one was only last week. When they, when, when they invaded Malacca, which was a government... I guess I laughed really because, uh, yes, because in my serious. business I know that you know, uh, people is, I'm not one side accuses the other, the other one accuses the other. Okay, so... let us just take the, yeah. la the, the last example, yeah? which happened only last week. When the rebels invaded the town of Malacca, which is a, a, a town under the government control. Mm. Yeah? We but have not I, even had... Uh, but until uh, uh, back now in Malacca? Yes, we are. Uh, well, yes, we are. <laughs> so but, did you but, get but, there? No, the point is that this was a violation of the ceasefire agreement. Well, I, yeah. under, I understand. So, yeah. yeah. So uh, the, the international community, uh, go to go back to the question of uh, Samuel, the international community have been very supportive. Uh, in fact, the Troika have been uh, funding the talk in IGAD, and the government is ready to go back to the IGAD mechanism to sign the peace agreement with the rebels if they are when and when they are ready to come and, and discuss peace. I see. Well, let's stay in Uganda. Good evening, Andrew. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Shaka. Good evening. I am hugely terrific. How are you today, Nderea? Andrew. Uh, I'm, I'm okay, sir. Uh, I, I want to first make a comment on, on the point you made about the presence of UPDF. You, ha you, South have, South you have a minute, Andrew, because there are so many people in <laughs> the <laughs> queue, please, <laughs> in the queue. <laughs> Yes, I, 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 as a neighboring country, I think Uganda cannot have, uh, cannot afford a, a, another failed state in the region. We already have a crisis in Mogadishu, and we, we have refugees coming from South Sudan. I think as neighbors, we, we have a stake. The second one is the, the support of Mr. Riyak Mashar. I think we need to look at the personality of, of these leaders. You remember, I think Riyak Mashar has a history of, of, of rebellion. In the year 1991, in August, he attempted a coup on the then leader, uh, Mr. John Garang, doctor. And, and although the, the, the coup did not succeed, but it started the division, the, the South Sudan communities were deeply divided. And these organic divisions were later exacerbated by the regimes in Khartoum. I think this is the same crisis. This division started then with Dr. Riyak Mashar. Thank you. Then Thank you Mr. very Mr. much. Uh, Thank you very much, Andrew, really. Let's not go back to history of 1991 because, let's face it, these guys were able to reconcile with each other. They were able to work together. As a matter of fact, when Dr. John Garang uh, died on July 31st, 2005, and I had actually interviewed him right here about three weeks earlier than that, he had told me how they were working very closely with his colleague, Dr. Riyak Machara and others to bring peace and, in fact, stability to Sudan. So I don't think we need to keep going to 1991, really. Let's go back. Let's go to Los Angeles. Uh, go, is it good morning in Los Angeles, uh, uh, Hi, David? Uh, this, yes, this is David uh, uh, Shaka. Thank you for taking my call. So just a quick question, and I'll take uh, your response off of the air. Mm -hmm. To represent uh, Representative Tang and um, Ambassador Wall, 
It seems to me that this uh, conflict is really being... A Hello? We are having some technical difficulties of all places from the city of the angels? <laughs> yes. I can't okay. believe this. Uh, David, are you there? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, we were having some technical difficulties. Uh, can you talk okay, again? No. Please. Yes, so, okay, so I'll... I'll my question. Is, is, um, is it possible that we could uh, raise this, you know, put the question back to the people of South Sudan via... Positive solution in the south. So a division, one stage to be led by Mr. Machar, and another one by uh, Mr. Kier. And I'd like uh, Mr. Tang and Mr. Wall to address that, so that we can end all this fighting. Thank An you. Another state. Uh, it's very interesting because maybe it touches on the issue of federalism. There is the issue of federalism, which I think is on the table, and I think that. Uh, only recently, when the two principals met with Kenyan President uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, I think it was one of the key uh, issues that uh, made them not even go anywhere. Would you like to react to that? Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much, Shaka. I, I think I will not go to the press caller because you already answered 1991. That. Yeah. So Why do we I keep answer? going back? Can I, can I Yeah, answer? please. Okay, yeah. Yes, uh, about 1991, actually, uh, the... It was not cool. It was, you know, a division no, of the president. Said, said you are not Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Even people like Lama Cole. Lama yeah. Cole were part of the game. Yeah, that, what have you? It, it was a different. Andrew was making a point. It was a different of the vision. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Riek wanted uh, South Sudan as an independent country. Correct. And, and Garang won the, the whole Sudan. This is where the two leaders... Uh, were different. Even though, okay. even, okay. The, and, even, and, though and, even and Dr. Garanga's yeah. wife herself has told me, true. frankly, and that uh, she yes. Uh, yes. used to remind her husband that he may, in fact, have been sleeping with an enemy. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Therefore, you know, when people were divided, not only Dr. Riyak, there were a lot of people uh, going with Dr. Riyak, like Dr. Lam, those are rocks on a rock, those could be no quiet. These were those people who believed that they need South Sudan because it seemed that Garang was taking people for a ride and people did not understand what they were going for for the, for, for the Sudan. So the, the, that one was not, uh, was not actually a, a coup that you call a coup. Of course, people die in both sides. And, and, and good enough, they came to reconcile him and Garang. So we, we say now this has become a party story. And, and Dr. Rick still have the vision of having South Sudan. By the way... The 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 the, the 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 peace agreement, the comprehensive peace agreement, was actually a, a, a sandwich of a cartoon peace agreement that Dr. Yeka signed, because Dr. Yeka was, was, was the internal was the champ, was the, was the champion the of, internal of self determination. Yeah. And actually, the self determination was what differ, what what make Riek Machar except to match with Garang, because fact, when Garang accept that, the self-determination will I be can, included. I can, I can claim credit for having uh, linked Riyak Machar with John Garang through Ugandan president, Yoweri Museveni. He met, I remember, with Riyak Machar in a town called Kasani in Botswana, and flew to Uganda, and eventually Riyak Machar and John Garang we are back doing business together against Khartoum. Yeah. Unfortunately, time Shaka. happens not to be our best ally. And here we have to be democratic. We have to go. On that note, thanks to our distinguished guests, Ambassador Barak Wall, Deputy Head of Mission of the Embassy of the Republic of South Sudan to the U.S., Reith Muwok Tang, SPROM slash SPROA in opposition, a representative to the United States. And last but not least, Noah Gottschalk, Senior Police Advisor for Humanitarian Response at Oxfam America, based here in the nation's capital. Thanks to our field stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not better, South Sudan. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>